to give some of our GPU experience uh, with the Cafe Cafe, so it's a machine learning package that do uh, deep convolutional neural networks. I will uh, have more details later, but we are just using these packages to do like uh, to 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 deploy deep convolutional neural networks, and uh, we are not like really programming at the low level to like try to accelerate accelerate the code. And basically, we don't touch the C++ code, but we, yeah. So we have some tweaks to make them work with our project. So our project we are working on is a, a neural science project. So we try to like uh, so try to build some predictive model for like neurons in a visual cortex. So the data can be in the forms of like we collect uh, monkeys looking at images, we collect the uh, neural activities of them, and also like human looking at the videos and pictures, we collect the FMI response of them um, looking at these things, and try to build a predictive model. And uh, the current like part, we the, the, so like from images or videos, we have to extract features from them, and uh, we use like deep convolutional neural networks that has already done pretty well in like in computer vision, like in like image recognition tasks and and the, uh, like uh, image localization or classification has they are, have done pretty well already. So once we have that kind of predict model, we try to like say something about neurons uh, pattern selectivity. Like here's like one example, uh, I'm not going into details, but here's one example Like we can say something about one neuron once we build a, a, a predictive model for that neuron, we can say something about its uh, like uh, receptive field of that, that neuron when that like when People look, a monkey look at that picture, and that neuron activates because there's something at that location, or what have what be activated when, when there's just something on the other location, and this neuron somehow like a, has the a, a tuning for like this kind of edges in that direction, and uh, so we also like tweak a little bit this you know, kind of neural networks to to discover like based on our predict model. Which kind of images will like maximum activate ac activate like the uh, this model's response? So it's basically they, they call them deep dreaming in computer vision, but it's basically gradient ascent method to find the input image that uh, maximize your model response. And therefore, that neuron, for example, it's uh, this kind of image like from random response we find that that will maximize the response of this kind of neuron based on. Our on our model, so so uh, yeah, just something brief about our project. So we are basically using the cafe package to 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 deploy the deep convolutional neural network and extract the features. And uh, so cafe is a deep learning framework made. Uh, so uh, basically developed at Berkeley with the uh, the computer vision folks at Berkeley. And it has a pure C++ architecture, and along with that, as a CUDA implementation, so it has a GPU acceleration, and it's very easy to use. Uh, has some with some with this uh, Python MATLAB interface, and uh, so here I want to show some like uh, so cafe performance when using cafe. Like, what's the advantage of using GPU at a when compared to like using CPU, we have so these experiments are done with uh, like uh, the the cafe net the reference like uh, the, the reference uh, image classification model that works pretty well in the image net challenge. So this kind of neural network, this is a, like a sketch of the neural network. You take the image as input and uh, like. A, and the output is going to be 1,000 label because this network is doing classification uh, among like 1,000 classes. So like has about 60 million parameters. So the, the this is the performance they reported. So it, the advantage of using like GPU here, you can like, so in the testing you give an image and the chart will give you label. and. Uh, the advantage of using GPU is about like ten times faster than using uh, you see using like GPU code. Uh, and and are, but and for both of those, those are using Cafe, but one with the CPU and yeah, one with the yeah, GPU. Yeah, right. So both of them were using Cafe, and uh, 
this is a CPU only, and this part is the using GPU only for the feed forward parts. So for the testing, you image and uh, get a label. For the training, basically, it's uh, slightly different. So you have image pass, and you have feed forward pass, and then you back propagate your gradient. You have a back, back forward pass of that neural network. So the the speed is a lot of, uh, small, uh, slower for each image. So it takes about five milliseconds per image. Uh, yeah. So like. What's our experience here? So our experience, uh, I did some experiments on our GPU cluster, and uh, like train, uh, train the coupling net I mentioned to to achieve the 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 state of about about, about the state of the art of the image classification results. You basically need some four hundred and fifteen thousand iterations, and uh, the batch size is going to be two hundred fifty six. So you have need to process that amount of that amount of images, and that would take about five days of training of training on the GPU. And uh, if we don't do that, that with GPU, basically we have to like use about like a month to, to finish the training. So that's the main advantage of uh, like using GPU. And uh, we also did some tests of uh, using like uh, so here. I, I mentioned like we try to visualize the, the image that maximizes the model response, and we do like this gradient based method, and there's a forward pass and the, the backward pass. So we did them with the Python interface. The Python interface is slightly slower when you use directly the the shell. So yeah, so it's about seven milliseconds per edition. Uh, here is mentioned also like our K20 GPU is slightly more slower than like K40 GPU yeah, because of the computational power. And uh, like in the last time I tried to like go into a little bit in like into the C++ code of the cafe to see uh, so where they, they are using GPU and uh, what's the main part yeah, uh, of the code that using GPU and try to accelerate. And so the convolutional neural network seems like complicated neural network, but there's a common pattern here, is that like the convolutional pattern. So you do convolution and max pooling and then activation. So these three steps always like exist, like, like you, you step them layer by layer. So basically when you do implementation, you do, uh, so the main part is in this convolutional part, and they can be seen as a, like a huge matrix pr product. So you have uh, like your input, maybe a 3D tensor, and then your filter is also a 3D tensor. You do a convolution along x and y axis, and you can formulate this as a huge matrix, matrix product. And then if it's implemented in CPU, People will use the, the BLAST library, so it's basically like matrix product a subroutine that is imp implemented to accelerate, accelerate the computation. And in CAFE, if you want, if you do with the GPU, then like just replace everything, every function in BLAST with the corresponding function with the cool BLAST, and this like this how that how how the, how the convolutional layer was implemented. So the convolutional layer, so basically each layer of the neural network has to implement this kind of function, like do the feed forward pass and the backward pass, and you stack them together to build a neural network. So, so Cafe actually makes difference between this feed forward using CPU and feed forward using uh, GPU and backward using CPU and backward using CPU. And uh, so, like, look at the CPU code and GPU code difference. So the only difference is actually here, when you try to use a matrix matrix. So here is trying to use a matrix matrix product, using the data from the bottom layer, and your convolutional weights, and to get the to get the to get the data for the top layer. So that's the how that feed forward works. Right? So main difference is here, like. One is using GPU and one is using CPU. And if you look into like how these functions are called, one is using the BLAST library, 
and the, the other one is using the Kublas library to do matrix matrix product. And that's like how the main part of Scafe using GPU. Uh, and all, but now like the recent version actually has introduced another way to using GPU is through the uh, cool DNN library. So this is like a specific deep uh, neural network library. We can like NVIDIA recently released that. Uh, so we can do that with uh, so we can use that, that directly. Basically, what it did introduce this kind of function, cool DNN convolutional fuel, uh, convolution forward. And this function actually wipes everything we describe together. So you don't have to write these four loops again. So you, you just call this function, and it does the, does the optimization for you. So somehow it's uh, slightly faster than uh, we are calling the Kublas library. So they optimize the, the convolutional step for you. And yeah, and that's basically it. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> Hi everyone, so uh, I'm going to uh, showcase a toy example using a recurrent neural network to generate um, character by character. Uh, let me explain the idea. And um, the example is taken from the Keras package. And Keras is built upon uh, Piano, which is a package in Python. Uh, the advantage of Piano is it will do uh, automatic differentiation for you. So if you, if you uh, define the loss function, Piano would give you the derivative, and you can just do um, gradient descent on it to train the neural network or any other kind of model. Um, I heard it works with TensorFlow also. Have you, have you tried that? Or? I, I tried TensorFlow. It's like with with Keras. Oh no, no, not oh. with Keras. Yeah. I, yeah, I just it. TensorFlow the their example code. Uh -huh. Supposedly, the TensorFlow will compile the graph faster than Piano or something. Mm. Um, so let me describe the example. So I have the data set of a long text. For example, I, here I'm using the friend subtitle. Uh, this is the, the first um, conversation in friend uh, TV show. Uh, and the idea is I will try to, um, I will fit the model, like for example, three characters, P, H, and E, and the model will try to predict the next character one by one. And then after it predicts the next character, um, it would use the last three characters and then predict the next character one by one, trying to generate a bunch of those. And hopefully like, it will make some sense. It will be like correct English word or correct like, grammar. Um, and then the model I'm using is a recurrent neural network. Um, for those of you who are new to this model, it's basically trying to model, so why for is like the fourth character based on the condition on the previous three characters uh, with the hidden layer here. Um, what this means is not a directed graphical model, but it's more like a functional form. The relation between y4 and y1, y2, y3 um, is in this form. So y4 is a function of um, s3, s3 is a function of s2 and y3, and um, the, the function between uh, y2, y, uh, y3, and s2 to s3 is the same like the function of s1, y2 to, y, to s2. So um, that is like the basic recurrent neural network. The one that I'm actually using is slightly um, more complicated, but that's like the idea. Trying to predict the fourth character if, based on the previous three characters. And um, the loss function here is a smoky normal loss, and we train it with the gradient descent. Um, so um, uh, Tiano just gives you the uh, automatic differentiation, then uh, this would make it easier. So let me show you how to do on the cluster. Uh, Kara is very easy to use. It's like scikit-learn, if you have ever used scikit-learn before. <coughs> okay, so let me log into our group. 
I'm going to run the part that um, pre-processed the, the, uh, process the data. And then I will show you how to uh, define the model in Keras. It's actually pretty simple. So you define a model by first, um, define a sequential. Let's wait for the, while we're waiting, it's logging in like the DB releases. What's the format to get in? Oh, uh, S run minus minus G res. G res. Oh, this e one with the GPU. I don't need the GPU. Uh, I don't oh, you don't need the GPU? OK, let me, I guess I run this first. So I, I, yeah. I just define model equal to sequential. Um, and then I would add the first layer, uh, which is a LSTM. It's like a, a flavor of recurrent neural network. And uh, the input is the length of the character, which is, uh, I suppose, in English, there's like 26 characters. And in, the sheet, in addition, there's like digit, there's symbol. So in overall, there's like 100 characters. That's like the length of the input. And then the output dimension, I'm just using 128 of those um, recurring nodes. Uh, so that's the first layer. And then to, um, I'm adding this drop out, which is like a popular trick in neural network. And then I will add another LSTM layer. So it's a two layer. And then uh, I add another drop out. And then uh, finally, I'm connecting to the Y4, trying to predict the next character. And, uh, Activation here is softmax, and the loss function here is um, categorical cross entropy, which is the multinomial loss function. What is dense doing? Uh, which one? Dense is um, um, dense mean it's not recurrent, so dense like um, a linear combination from the previous layer to this layer. Oh, that's a matrix multiplication. A matrix multiplication, yeah. Followed by an activation. It's a matrix multiplication. And then um, the model will compile. Uh, with optimizer RMS prop, which is a flavor of gradient descent, and uh, the loss function is categorical at cross entropy. Basically, after doing this, the um, it will compile trying to get the uh, gradient of the loss function. Uh, it will take a minute to run, but after this is done, all you all you need to do is similar in a uh, scikit learn. You you just do model dot fit x and y, and it will run for a while. It will take like a couple hours to run, and then uh, we will see some pretty interesting pattern. Uh, let me uh, log in and see the. So hopefully that the is using a one twenty six. There and then now when you model the fit, you will run something like that, and then it's using this hard to see. Yeah, but you see that it's using 72% of the GPU, and then it's using 123 megabyte RAM. And if you wait for this to run, uh, you see some interesting pattern that is the first epoch is trying to uh, pronounce like the easy word, like the short word, and then later on it's trying to pronounce like correctly the harder to uh, pronounce word, and then after that it would try to. Um, Get like the grammar correct to so here's some result. For example, at the at the end of the iteration one, there's still some uh, incorrect word like sort or like uh, mill with another L. And then up the, going to iteration ten, you will see that most of the words are correct um, English word, but then uh, the grammar might not be correct. For example, we don't want to be my two, so that's not really correct grammar. But then if you run it until like iteration sixty, then the grammar starting to be like. Uh, correct. And here I'm conditioned on 30 previous characters and then generates the next character. Uh, and it also learned to do like punctuation and end of line, just like the original uh, subtitle data. And uh, yeah. so that is the result of the credit, for the credit for the Keras. I'm just using the example then for my data set. And do you have a sense of sort of what, what's the core functionality that's being implemented on the, that's being done on the GPU? Uh, I think it's the part of uh, updating the gradient descent, so the whole vector of weight vector, and then they just put that vector equal to um, uh, that vector, then minus the alpha times a very complicated gradient, and that gradient by calculating the gradient is being done 
question. Questions? So, and also getting the gradient. I suppose. mean, all the variables are being stored in the GPU. It's not like transferring them over each time, presumably. So, just sort of all, all the calculation, I think. Like the image, like for, for the entire optimization? Yeah, I think. Yeah. You usually transfer it between the main memory and the right. GPU memory. So. I think the weight matrix is stored on the GPU. Yeah, yeah, it just sits there the whole time. Thank you. Okay, and then to close things out, I thought I would talk about this um, sort of low-level example um, of basically I'm going to do a fairly simple Monte Carlo um, calculation on the GPU and just show a couple phases of optimizing the kernel code um, for that example. Okay, so this is the same demo material that I was um, showing last time, um, and the, if you want to actually grab it, it's at that um, in that Git repository. Um, and so this is section seven of that um, of that material. And so the basic, um, I'll, I'll just go through what the example calculation is, and then I'll show the the, the CUDA code for doing this. Um, so basically. Those of you who are familiar with probit regression, you may know that you can have you. There's a latent variable representation of probit regression, which is that um, if you want to have a probit regression on um, some covariance x, you can represent this as the normal CDF. Um, so this is this is just basic probit uh, regression. But you can also rewrite that in a latent variable representation. So your observation y um, is one if this latent variable w is bigger than zero. Um, and this, um, sorry, yeah, less than zero. I just switched this to uh, greater than less than here. Um, and then uh, the latent variable w is normal uh, with the linear predictor and then a variance of one. So if you then want to recover what the probability is from, what, from this model, you then need to do a calculation of the normal CDF, which you do, wouldn't need to do by Monte Carlo expectation. We have algorithms for, for um, numerically estimating that, that integral. But the, more, the, the actual example I want to talk about is a multinomial uh, extension of probit regression. And in the multinomial setting, basically, you can, um, if you have a W for each of the categories, one up through K, um, and then if you have each of the W's follow a normal distribution where you have a different beta for each of the categories, then um, the category of Y is basically determined by whichever of the W's is largest. Okay. So then, so you can go ahead and say fit this model in a Bayesian context, for example, using MCMC, and we're doing this for, a, um, for an ecological uh, a biology example. But we then, after we've done that fitting, we then need to recover what the probability vector is that corresponds to this model. So basically, what's the probability of being category one, category two, category three, it's an on up through category k. Um, and so one way that you could estimate those probabilities is basically by Monte Carlo sampling. And so you could just generate for i up through some large number m, you could basically generate a vector of w's, of capital K different w's, and then figure out what's, which is the biggest one of those and say that, that in, for that case you're going to get category, whichever one is the biggest, the argmax. Um, and so if you do this many, many times, basically the empirical proportion of times that each of the given w's is the biggest corresponds to the probability of being in that category. Um, so that's basically, you know, so it's a very, it's a very simple algorithm, but um, the nice thing about it from, um, from the perspective of just doing an example here is basically there, if I then have, this was just for one observation, but if I have many, many different observations, then I basically have three loops here. And I can think about sort of different ways of implementing the calculation on a GPU. So I, I, I need to loop over the different observations, which in this case are different spatial locations. And then I'm going to need to, I also need to loop over the number of Monte Carlo samples 
and then when I'm figuring, when I'm generating the Ws and figuring out which one of them is the max, then I'm iter then I'm looping over the capital K different categories. So there's a th series of three three uh, nested loops that I need to need to do here. So just to sort of um, draw this out in maybe a, a sort of a graphical form that might be a bit more evocative, I can think of one way of, for for one for a single observation. Um, I can think of this being the number of Monte Carlo samples and the number of columns being the number of categories. And then for a given, I'm going to call, I'm going to call alpha the collection of these different x beta k's. So this is x uh, beta 1 up through x beta capital K. Um, so what I need to do now is I basically need to generate these, this whole matrix of standard random normals. And then in order to get that normal x beta k, I basically need to add this vector of alphas onto each row, vector-wise, onto each row of the matrix. And then from there, I need to figure out for each row uh, um, which is the maximum of these. So that's going to give me a vector y. And maybe it might be the first one might be the max here, and then maybe the third one in this row, and maybe the fifth one, and then maybe the first one. And then I basically just need to tabulate these y's to get the proportions. And that will give me my, um, my, my estimates of the probabilities from the Monte Carlo uh, sampling. OK, so questions about the, the underlying algorithm before I go on to the coding? So, OK, so the idea was I, I thought I would compare um, just doing this purely uh, in R, doing it in C++, and then doing it with a few different uh, variations of using the GPU. Um, I'll leave aside the R, exam, the R part of it, because that's, that's a fair bit slower than, than C++, which is more of a, a baseline comparison against which we can compare the GPU. So when I implemented this in C++, it took about six seconds to do this for 10,000 Monte Carlo samples, for 21 categories, and for 26,000 observations. Um, and that was six seconds on eight cores. And the code, um, this is done using calling C++ from R using RCPP. Um, you know, the core of it is just, is just some C++ code, basically. Um, and so I won't go into sort of the details of calling it from R, but just to look at the, the core computation, in this particular case and in the GPU code as well, I'm choosing to basically parallelize over the different observations. So basically, um, each of the different computational tasks is doing this calculation for a single observation, and then I'm, then I'm doing that uh, in parallel. So this calculation for a single observation is basically the code that is sitting inside this loop here, where i is looping over observations. Um, so there's a little bit of initialization. And then at the core of the computation, I'm doing the looping over the different Monte Carlo samples. <coughs> and then here, I'm generating my um, w's, which are the normal x beta k variance 1 as being some random numbers that I generate offline because I can actually reuse all the random numbers for the different uh, observations. So I just generated these once outside uh, in R, actually, I think, even, um, and then pass them in. And then um, I'm adding on the alphas, which are these, which are these means, to my, basically to my matrix, to, well, to each row of the generated random numbers. And then I've just got the implementation of figuring out which one for that row is the maximum and incrementing this probs um, value by one. And then I divide by the number of money color samples to get the estimate. So that's the C++ code. And I'm just using OpenMP basically here to parallelize over the different observations. So now if I translate that to... Um, to the GPU. So this is actually, I, I did this using this R CUDA package to call the GPU code. But again, the, the real core of all this is just in the, in the kernel code, in the CUDA code. So the details of how we're calling it from R are not particularly important. If you wanted to call it from Python, you could just as easily do that or call it from, from a C program as well. Um, so here's what the CUDA code looks like. Um, so I decided, uh, if you remember from last time, we need to figure out how to set up 
how to do the parallelization and set up what are going to be the different threads and how many threads are going to be grouped into a block and how are the blocks going to be grouped into, uh, how, the, how, how many blocks are we going to set up. Um, so basically here I chose to have um, each of the observations is going to be handled by one thread and I'm going to group the threads into groups of 192 threads per block and then I'm just going to figure out how many blocks do I need to cover the full 26,000 uh, observations. So that's, that's how I decided, that's how I did the, that's how I set up the, the blocking. Um, and so basically this kernel code is basically going to get one, run once for each of the observations. And here I'm just checking, I'm not going to run it if the observation number is, is bigger than the total number of observations I have. Um, so basically this code is, is the code that just does it for one observation. So again, it's just implementing this calculation. Um, and it doesn't look too much different than the C++ code. Again, I'm taking my random numbers, I'm adding them, uh, standard normals, I'm adding on the mean here to generate my Ws, and then I'm just walking through and figuring out which of the Ws is the maximum, and then whichever W is the maximum, I'm going I'm to increment the, basically I'm going to increment for that category, I'm going to increment uh, by one. So for this particular um, calculation, I just I sort of somewhat arbitrarily when I was first coding this up, I chose to set this up such that the um, alphas looked like this. They were basically laid out like this. So this is one up through k. And then the alphas, I, I've got a separate set of alphas, uh, one for each observation. So this is one up through n. So basically, I have a matrix like this that I'm passing in um, to the GPU memory from the CPU. Um, and one thing that you'll notice here is when I access these alphas, um, basically, um, if I think about, I should, I should back up here and say that um, sort of one of the key things when you're thinking about optimizing uh, the kernel code on the GPU is to think about how about your access to the GPU memory because that ac access to that memory can be fairly slow. So the idea is to try and figure out what are good ways to uh, access that memory quickly uh, such that, that the uh, computations will go more quickly. And so um, if when I have the problem set up like this, basically the um, I'm basically within this loop here, um, incrementing by k to access the alphas for the different um, observations. So if I'm if I have a thread that is, for example, operating on this observation in this row, and it gets the k the lowercase k value, it's going to get this value in the matrix. So if this were if this were one of the threads, let's call this thread number one. And then the next thread, I'll call this thread two, when it goes ahead and accesses the alphas, you'll notice this i is incrementing over observations. So it's basically going to access this value in the matrix, or the next column over in the matrix. So the thing about that is that the way that I passed in this matrix from R is it basically gets passed in column-wise. So the, these values in the first column are contiguous in the GPU memory, and then the next column, and then the next column, and the next column. And if you look at the advice on how to write more efficient GPU code, uh, if you look at that, one of the things that's suggested is to make sure that contiguously numbered threads are accessing memory continuously from the GPU memory. So in this case, this thread this, if I think about sort of a group of a small number of threads, and for, for our purposes, let's think about 30, a group of 32 threads, and I'll say why in a minute. Thir those, a group of 32 threads will be accessing these values at this line of the computation. Um, and they're accessing them basically in what are called strides of lower K, of, um, um, of actually basically strides of capital K. So, in memory, this is not adjacent to this, is not adjacent to this. Rather, this is adjacent to this one down here, is adjacent to this one down here, and so forth, and so on and so forth. So the, and the code as I wrote it is, um, is not, uh, sequentially numbered threads are not accessing basically sequential memory locations. And the thing about the way that the GPU ex executes computations is 
it basically, um, within a block, it, ba it basically groups the threads within a block into these things called warps, which are groups of 32 threads. And when in, in, in a warp, can ba when, a, when, when threads within a warp go and get memory, get uh, values from the GPU memory, um, all of the threads in the warp can basically go and grab a chunk of contiguous memory from the GPU very quickly. So if we could set up the computation such that, say, a warp of 32 threads were actually able to grab these values such that these values were all contiguous in, um, in memory, then that would potentially go uh, much more quickly. So, so the idea now is I'm going to refine the code here such that I'm basically going from, I'm sort of going to reorient the matrix in this, in this direction so that I can basically access, um, contiguous threads can basically access memory uh, contiguously. So, so the first, um, so just to give you an idea of the speed here, when I ran this on SCF SM20, took about six seconds to run on eight cores, and just this basic CUDA code that I just showed you was actually a bit slower. It's actually about twice as, uh, twice as slow running just with that code that I just showed you. And what we'll see is that when I change to using uh, continuous memory, uh, continuous memory allocations, it goes down by a, a, nice, a nice speed up, although we're going to see we can do even better than that. Um, oops. So the... So this idea of sort of grabbing a block of memory from, uh, grabbing a block of values from the GPU memory uh, in, in grouped by these, these warps, is called, warps is called coalescing uh, the memory accesses. Um, so here's the idea of, of changing around the code to make that more efficient. So instead of having the setup look like this, I'm now going to pass in the alphas such that they look like this, and this is now going to be 1 through n, and this is going to be 1 up through k. And so now I've got, if I call this, if I'm thinking about a thread here, like the first thread, a thread that I'm just calling the first one, and I think about a thread that I'm calling the second thread. Now, um, the strides that get used here are incrementing by i. And so what that means is, if we're on a given value of lowercase k, I'm going to be, the first thread is going to get that value, and then the next thread is going to get that value, and the next thread is going to get that value. And I've passed the values into the GPU memory such that these values are now basically in adjacent locations in the GPU memory. So then these, these 32 threads that are in a warp are basically, they basically execute in lockstep. So um, if we think about those 32 threads, those, each of those 33 threads is basically going through and they're executing this line and this line and this line and looping and executing this line. They're doing that all together. And so basically, when those 32 threads go to get these values, they're each, each one of them basically, they're, they're, actually, they're basically grabbing this whole set of 32 values basically all at once. And that can happen fairly much more quickly than, than the previous picture. Um, so that was sort of optimized by just sort of thinking about sort of row major versus column major and how the, the values are laid out in memory and which of the threads are going to be grabbing which values at, uh, as they go through the execution. Okay, so questions or comments before I go on to the next thing? Okay, so then the next thing that um, one can think about is that I mentioned that accessing... Uh, the general GPU memory can be fairly slow. So the GPUs also provide something called shared memory. And so basically all of the threads within a block, and I mentioned before that I might have, say, 192 threads within a block, they can basically access a small amount, 48 uh, kilobytes per block, of shared memory that you can think of as a programmer-managed cache. And so basically what you can think about doing is how could I move data from the general GPU memory, the device memory, to the shared memory and repeatedly work with that data on shared memory to do the, the core computations. So that what we're going to see is that those, those calculations, if I, if I can get that right, I can actually speed things up uh, quite a bit. The other thing that won't come up here but does come up when you're thinking about this is all the threads within a block, you can synchronize those, those threads. So you can basically run a bunch of lines of code and then say, synchronize the threads such that 
wait for all of the threads within a block to finish, and then go on to the next steps. And that can be important for particular algorithms to, to basically put these barriers in. In this particular example, I didn't need to do that. But sort of the, the importance of how many threads you put in a block and the idea of thinking about blocks is you can synchronize threads within a block, and the threads within a block can, sh can share this, this shared memory. OK, so I noticed when I was, um, when I was looking at this code and thinking about how could I use shared memory effectively is that we're basically using the W values um, over and over again when we're doing this computation. You know, we're, we're going through, we're assigning to the W values, then we're figuring out which is the maximum one, and then we're basically accessing uh, this probs vector uh, repeatedly as well. So the idea was, let me try and see if I can put W and probs into shared memory and do the calculations in shared memory um, and see how much of a speed up that would, would give us. So basically now what I'm doing, what I'm doing in terms of this picture is, oh, I should have also mentioned in the previous code, in this code, I was basically allocating memory for W and that gets allocated on the general GPU memory and not in the shared memory. So it, I can allocate it, but then it's going to be, it's, it's potentially slow to be, to be working with it and accessing it. So the idea is I'm now going to think about um, creating, for each, for each block of threads, I'm going to create basically a W matrix, one up through the number of threads per block, threads in a block, which I'll call capital T. So this is going to be my set of Ws. There's going to be a row of Ws for each of the threads, and that's going to correspond to each of the, there's going to be an observation for each thread as, as before. And similarly, I'm going to have a local shared memory probs variable, uh, one up through capital T. So, um, so the shared memory version of this looks like the following. So one thing to notice here is basically the shared memory is just a, basically a big pool of memory. And when you call the kernel, you basically say, how much shared memory do I want to use? So I need to do a little bit of stuff with pointers here to basically take my big block of shared memory and basically divide it up into half of it I'm going to use for W and half of it I'm going to use for props. So that's what I'm doing uh, here with some basically just some simple pointer kinds of calculations. Um, and then, um, and then I'm basically initializing this prob shared, which is this set of values for this particular uh, bl uh, block of threads. And then the core computation looks like this. So now, instead of uh, now in terms of accessing the W, I basically have to do the indexing such that I make sure to be careful about which row of this W matrix I'm working with. And similarly, I need to sort of deal with the indexing of which row of that shared probs uh, matrix I'm working with. But all of this calculation, except for just grabbing the random numbers and grabbing the alphas, all of this is now basically happening in shared memory um, because of the way that I've, I've set this up. And then at the end of the day, um, there's no way for the CPU to access the shared memory. And in fact, when a, when a block of threads finishes its computation, it's basically then that, that shared memory is going to get cleaned out and it's going to get used for another block of threads. So basically, before this kernel finishes, I basically need to copy the values from the shared memory probs. And I'm basically, my sort of overall vector of uh, matrix of probabilities basically is the same size as the vector of alphas. I'm basically computing my estimate of the probabilities for all of the locations i from 1 to n and all the categories from 1 to k. So basically, to transfer stuff from the shared memory onto the general GPU memory, I'm basically taking this little block, this little matrix, and this is basically a sub-matrix of this guy. So I'm basically having to move this from the shared memory into the general memory. And I have to you know, sort of make sure that I'm getting all the indexing right such that I'm moving it into the, into the right place here. Um, so a lot of this is just sort of the low-level details of sort of managing the how I'm using memory and how I'm doing the indexing and moving things around uh, such that I just I just get the details get the details right. Okay, so once I do that, I actually got a pretty nice uh, speed up from doing from using that shared memory. So it went down from 
8.5 to 1.5, so a factor of five or six fold uh, speed up in using in using shared memory. And now we see that this is uh, this is now about four times faster than using C++ with eight cores. Um, and one thing I mentioned last time, I think, is that um, using uh, single precision floating point numbers is faster on the GPU than using double precision. So all of this that I've done so far was just simply using double precision just because I'm sort of used to doing that. And then I, then I wanted to see, well, how much of a difference does it make to go from using double precision to using single precision? And so in this case, we get about a two and a half fold uh, speed up from using single precision. And for this calculation, it doesn't really make a difference. You know, I don't need all of that precision for this particular uh, calculation. So ultimately, here, after a bunch of this optimization, which you know took me a little while, but you know wasn't a, wasn't a huge amount of work, I get about a tenfold uh, speed up. And it was interesting when I did this. This was on SCF SM20 on the SCF um, GPU. When I did it on Savio, I actually found that this was a tenfold speed up. On Savio, the C++ time was more like ten seconds compared to six seconds, whereas the GPU time was more like 0.3 seconds to point compared to 0.6. So there, I got that the, the speed up was more like 30 times. So obviously, there's some variation depending on the exact CPU hardware you have and the exact GPU hardware you have and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that yeah, that was basically what I thought I would would say. I think you know there's lots of there would be lots even for this simple calculation. I think there's lots more room to try and play around and see if you could optimize things. Like you might think about taking this vector of alphas and and moving some of the data from the alphas into shared memory. You might think about having the threads instead of parallelizing the threads across observations. You could think about parallelizing the threads across the Monte Carlo samples. Or you could parallelize the threads across the pairwise combinations of Monte Carlo samples and observations, and try and think through, you know, what would be the most efficient way to to set up this uh, this particular computation. Um, so why don't we? Why don't I um, stop there and ask if there are any questions about that? Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I want to thank all the folks who uh, spoke for give their examples, and thanks for coming. <laughs>